uh, we want to talk just a little bit uh, about the history of uh, <clears throat> Catholic education in America, uh, and then the rest of the time specifically on the question of identity. But I think the history is important uh, to understand. Uh, I have some copies of a book that's a mini version of my doctoral dissertation on Catholic schools and Supreme Court, and I have a, a chapter on history. Uh, and I say it's important. Uh, obviously, you know, you can't function in a temporal vacuum. And uh, so where do you come from? And uh, and this, this background, I, I, I think, is important. Um, the first school uh, within the territorial expanse of what's now the United States was a Catholic school. That's the, actually, that's the first line of my doctoral dissertation. And the faculty advisor at Fordham said, huh, where, where are you getting this from? And, and I said, um, well, I see the Michigan contingent is, uh, oh, they're juicing up. My mother used to say, if you're not providing for everybody, you shouldn't have for yourself. <laughs> uh, but uh, he said, where is this coming from? And I said, well, if you read the next sentence, the modifier, it says the Catholic school established by the Franciscans in Florida in 1606. So, of course, if all you have is the Anglo understanding of American history, uh, naturally, you're thinking of the 13 original colonies, right? Uh, but 1606, uh, a number of years ago, I was doing a, a workshop for a faculty in the, in the Diocese of St. Augustine, Florida. And it happened to be Catholic Schools Week, and the pastor said, would you like to celebrate the school mass for the kids uh, and preach? And so, I generally do some kind of a version of a, a dialogue homily with, with grade school kids. And so I talked about how fortunate they were to be going to a Catholic school. And I said, does anyone know where the first Catholic school in the country was started? And hands went up all over the church. And I called on this one little kid, fourth grader, and he said, in this diocese, St. Augustine. And boy, they knew it and were they proud that the first Catholic school was in their diocese. Uh, and uh, so, and the opening of schools then followed in all of the Spanish territories. Uh, so, you know, on the East Coast, Florida, on the West Coast, uh, California, and, uh, and New Mexico. Uh, and most of all of that is being done by the Franciscans. The French exploration of the New World led to the opening of the first school for boys in New Orleans in 1722 by a Capuchin friar. And the Ursuline nuns opened a school for girls five years later in New Orleans. And those schools became prototypes of those to spring up in the French territories along the St. Lawrence River, in St. Louis, Kaskaskia, Detroit, Mackinac, and so forth, and Maine. In Maine, a Catholic school existed as early as 1640. Again, this doesn't register with us so often, huh? In the British colonies, Catholics experienced relative freedom only in Maryland, and that as long as Catholics ruled, all right, and in Pennsylvania. And it was places like that the Catholic education began its development into the system that it became. Uh, the first provincial council of Baltimore 1829, we have this decree. <clears throat> we judge it absolutely necessary that schools be established in which the young may be taught the principles of faith and morality while being instructed in letters. 1829. And the bishops of the nation made that judgment a matter of particular law for the United States at the Third Plenary Council of Baltimore in 1884. <clears throat> uh, so, and then much of what parochial schools became, and, and still are, came about through a series of events played out in New York City. And the chief protagonist there, some would say antagonist, was Archbishop John Hughes, um, who from 1840 to, 80, to 42 
was embroiled in a heated controversy over Catholic children and their education. His nickname uh, by the Protestants was Dagger John uh, because he would sign his name with the cross and when they were printing it, uh, it came as the dagger. And of course, because he was so in your face with his Catholicism, they nicknamed him Dagger John. Uh, but he, he was certainly, he was farm born Irish, but began, became an American citizen, knew the Constitution probably better than anybody else in New York City, and was about to use the Constitution to vindicate the rights of Catholic children. And what was the first issue that he was fighting? <clears throat> and we have to understand, again, prior to the 19th century, every school in the country was a religious school, was a denominational school. So you had you know, this school that was of a Presbyterian origin, this was Anglican, this was Methodist, <clears throat> and they were all considered public schools. They were all equally funded through tax dollars. And so Hughes comes on the scene, and the first thing he complains about is that the Catholic children are in these effectively denominational schools. And the first problem is anti-Catholic reading material for the kids. So for example, the McGuffey Reader, all right, which would be all kinds of jabs at, at popes and priests and nuns and everything else. These are reading textbooks for kids. And the second, Bible reading in, in the schools, using, of course, the God-ordained King James Version, right? And, and Hughes formed an interfaith coalition with Jews, and actually non-faith, atheists, to argue against Bible reading in the public schools. And it's amazing, in many ways, his move pushed us forward to the point where no prayer in public schools and all the rest of it. Uh, but he contended that the Bible reading in the public schools was a denominational exercise, which of course it really was. And then, having gotten the, the Bible reading out, he then said, but you know, um, we, we're going to start our own school at St. Peter's on Barclay Street in Lower Manhattan, the church where Mother Seton became a Catholic. She had been raised at Trinity Church on Broadway in, in Lower Manhattan as an Anglican, and she just took a trip a couple of blocks up to St. Peter's. And that became the first Catholic school. And so Hughes went to the school board of the city of New York and said, our school is established, and here you have to pay the salaries of our teachers as you're paying them for the Anglicans and the Presbyterians and all the rest. And they said, well, no, yours is a Catholic school. And he said, the Constitution says right, <laughs> that you may re, uh, support all religions or no religions, but not selectively. And they consulted their lawyers, and they said, you know, the old codger is right. <laughs> and so they said, okay, you're right. And they declared all of these Protestant schools common schools, and the Catholic school was sectarian. And so from that moment forward, the pattern was set that Catholic schools would never receive any government assistance, right? Uh, but it, it played out, you know, 20 miles away from here. Um, and uh, so the, the, you know, the good side of it all was it launched us on forming an independent school system and over which we had and still have total control. And uh, when we talk about you know, school choice issues later in the week, we're gonna see, I mean, this is, you know, there is something that we want, and at the same time, there's something we have to be very, very careful about. Huh? Uh, and Hughes uh, maintained his famous line, the time and the place have come where the school is more important than the church. And people would say today, huh, what? But he understood that if he lost that generation of children, there would be no church to be worried about whatsoever. And, uh, <clears throat> and Hughes was you know, adamant 
about the importance of, of, of Catholic schools. Now, he did not have the universal support of many of his brother bishops. Uh, many were with him, but there was a sizable portion of those who were not. So John Ireland, in the what became the Archdiocese of St. Paul, uh, wanted to use the public schools. And uh, he belonged to that class of individuals that we would call the Americanists, who wanted the Catholic population to blend in with the regular, so-called regular population, as much as possible. So in, in, in teaching Catholic doctrine, to minimize issues of conflict, and in terms of social interaction, uh, sure, why shouldn't our kids be with all the other kids? Uh, but Ireland uh, was roundly rebuked by other bishops like John Lancaster Spalding of Peoria. And, uh, and Spalding said, quote, without parish schools, there is no hope that the church will be able to maintain itself in America. But unlike Hughes, Spalding didn't want a penny of government money going into the Catholic schools because he saw very clearly that he who pays the piper calls the tune. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so while the first Catholic school operated as early as 1606, it took more than two centuries for these institutions to be organized in anything even quote, closely resembling a system. And it took a German-born or Bohemian-born redemptorist, naturalized American citizen, John Neumann, who in Philadelphia they call Newman, uh, who established a diocesan board of education with, interesting, in the 19th century, yeah, with clerical and lay representatives from every parish in the diocese. Right? Um, and through that body of advisors, and due to his own personal drive, parochial education prospered in Philadelphia and became a unified, coherent system, making Philadelphia a model for the nation and Neumann dubbed the father of parochial schools in America. Mother Seton is sort of the mother of Catholic education, but it wasn't parochial schools. It wasn't necessarily parish-based schools as it was Catholic schools in, in, in general. And by 1892, Philadelphia's Archbishop uh, Patrick John Ryan appointed a priest to full-time work as diocesan superintendent of schools. So, Monsignor and Kevin, you have Archbishop Ryan to thank for the great roles that you've had, all right? Um, it's interesting, when, when uh, Neumann became the Bishop of Philadelphia, I believe there were 10 Catholic schools. Now, his diocese, by the way, was all of Pennsylvania, part of South Jersey, and part of upstate New York, all of which he covered on horseback. And it's no wonder he was dead by, what, 46 or 47, all right? But when he started as, Arch as Bishop of Philadelphia, I believe there were fewer than 10 schools. By the time he died, there were 100. Okay. Again, due to the, to the vision and the drive of one, one man. Uh, and, uh, and then, after Ryan, you have, I mentioned earlier this evening, Cardinal Doherty, who reigned gloriously in Philadelphia from 1918 to 1951, right? And he began the system of free Catholic high schools. And that system prevailed in Philadelphia into the 1970s. And, uh, and unfortunately, it, it, it uh, was uh, abandoned. And what became, a, what was a priority for the ordinary was expected to be a priority for the clergy. And pastors who were unwilling to open new schools were threatened with removal. Uh, and, uh, and he followed through on it. Now, <clears throat> we're talking about Ireland being one of these Americanist bishops or an assimilationist. Uh, this did not sit well with Pope Leo XIII. Uh, who wrote his famous encyclical against what he called Americanism, and the encyclical in 1899, Testament of Valencia. And uh, he roundly condemned it, and that in turn gave a great impetus to the bishops who were in favor of launching their own Catholic school system. Um, 
1917, when the first code of canon law was promulgated, we find this canon. Catholic children <clears throat> are not to attend non-Catholic, neutral, or mixed schools. Right? Not to attend. And where no alternative was available, the bishop himself had to determine if there were any dangers to the faith, and then judge whether or not a dispensation from the law would be tolerable. And that prevailed until probably the 1950s. So in other words, attendance at a government school was categorically forbidden by church law. All right? uh, and what was the rationale for a rather stringent uh, injunction? Pius XI, in Divini Elius Magistri, 1929, wrote this. The so-called neutral school from which religion has, uh, from, excuse me, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, the so-called neutral school from which religion is excluded is contrary to the fundamental principles of education. Such a school, moreover, cannot exist in practice. It is bound to become irreligious. Notice his two points. A so-called neutral school is contrary to fundamental principles of education. Okay? You cannot be neutral about these matters. And then, secondly, such a school is bound to become irreligious. And we have the evidence for that in spades in the government school system. Huh? And then we have the Fathers of the Second Vatican Council in Gravissima Educationis. The church's involvement in the field of education is demonstrated especially by the Catholic school. Therefore, since it can contribute so substantially to fulfilling the mission of God's people and can further the dialogue between the church and the family of man to their mutual benefit, the Catholic school retains its immense importance in the circumstances of our times too. As for Catholic parents, the council calls to mind their duty to entrust their children to Catholic schools. And when I've preached about this, huh, I go around where pastors are in distress and they want to promote the school. And I quote this in a homily. People say afterwards, never heard that. Never heard that. It's, it's more than the third secret of Fatima, okay? <laughs> These people have some idea what that's all about, right? But no knowledge of this whatsoever. Uh, <clears throat> and then when I say this kind of stuff, you always get pushback as well. And in one parish in the... Uh, in the Denver Archdiocese, actually, uh, I was preaching uh, at the Saturday Vigil Mass, and at one point in the homily, an entire pew got up and walked out. And I said to the pastor, I said, who were those people? And he said, the family of the principal of the local public school. And see, this is one of the reasons why, we'll talk about this in the session on the priest as the PR man, this is one of the reasons why priests are afraid to say this kind of stuff, because you have all of these little lobby groups, all right? Uh, so the public school teachers, the CCD teachers, uh, da, 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 and all the rest of them, okay? Uh, but if we're not willing to say that, then what's the rationale? Why, why are we you know, spending our time? Well, I have to be able to, as Rick said in his talk at, at dinner, huh? Uh, you gotta tell people why they have to spend this extra money, right? And that's the reason. In 71, the American bishops issued a pastoral letter on Catholic education called To Teach As Jesus Did. Mm -hmm. And it was <clears throat> supposedly the standard by which to judge all Catholic schools. And we find the following statement. These schools are the most effective means available to the church for the education of children and young people. And some commentators have noted the irony that in that very same year, 1971, bishops back in their dioceses were closing schools at the rate of one a day. And there's a book called Mixed Signals, and it's by a priest, I believe, of the Diocese of Richmond, Virginia. And he talks about, uh, you remember his name, sister? Uh, Stephen, hmm. uh, it'll come. I, I may have brought it for show and tell time on Friday. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, and he makes the point that we have marvelous statements from, from, from bishops and the bishops' conference. But at a practical level, what's happening? And it's this absolute disconnect. So you have this statement at a national level, 
and at the local level, the, the exact opposite. In 1979, I opened the only Catholic school in the country that year. Right? One school opened in 79, a year where probably 100 or 200 had closed. Right? Uh, so the hemorrhaging was unbelievable. <clears throat> uh, and of course, that takes on a life of its own. Uh, so you know, there's a whole cycle of, of negativity and fear and everything else. And so it becomes a, a, a maelstrom. Uh, Pope Paul VI uh, wrote, sent a bicentennial message uh, to the Church of the United States uh, in, obviously, 1976. And here's what he says. The strength of the church in America is in her Catholic schools. The strength of the church in America is in her Catholic schools. And then the two saints that he canonized <clears throat> in connection with the bicentennial, John Wyman of Philadelphia and Mother Seton of New York, coincidentally, huh, are the prime movers in the Catholic school movement of the United States. Uh, uh, John Paul, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, was the Pope of, of Catholic schools. And uh, <clears throat> he wasn't on the job six months uh, when he sent, at the time was you know, high tech, 1979, a videotape message to the National Catholic Education Association, which was meeting in Philadelphia that year for their convention. And he said, I hope to give a new impulse to Catholic education throughout the vast area of the United States of America. Yes, the Catholic school must remain a privileged means of Catholic education in America, worthy of the greatest sacrifices. And then that following October, uh, or subsequently, he wrote his famous document, Ex Corte Ecclesiae, where he speaks of the church, of the school as what? The very heart of, of the church. Um, and, um, and then Benedict XVI, as I mentioned, uh, in 2008 with that marvelous address on the, the role of, of Catholic education. So, uh, then we want to talk, so any questions about the historical material? Over okay, here's the resume of much. You can buy my book. You said you don't have enough copies. <laughs> oh, well, we'll save one for, uh, for someone from the UK. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Yeah, you shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, Catholic identity. What are we talking about here? Uh, I like to refer to it as breathing Catholic air. All right? And uh, it's not so much having a checklist, all right? Uh, it's like that goofy Supreme Court justice who was a Potter Stewart who was asked you know, in the Supreme Court decision to define pornography. And he said, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it, mm -hmm. okay? And it's not really such a dumb answer. Uh, but it's the same thing about Catholic identity. Uh, sure, there are certain criteria, but also there's a feel about it, okay? Uh, <clears throat> So when I go to visit uh, a Catholic school, supposedly as, quote, a stranger, if kids don't greet me in the hallway, I say, there's a problem here, okay? It means either they're not used to seeing priests uh, or they've never been taught. Uh, my own alma mater, some years ago, I had some priests visiting uh, uh, our family home and I said, well, let's go. You can see the shrine that's erected to me in the high school that I went to. And it was a Friday afternoon, uh, <clears throat> about 3.30. And uh, so we get there, and of course, you know, school is out. I went to the office, principal was already gone. And the secretary, who was the secretary when I was in school there, and she said, well, you know your way around, just show them. And we were four priests. And we're walking around, and kids are coming out of club meetings and sports activities. And we're roaming around for about 35, 40 minutes. Probably encountered 50, 60 kids. And not a single kid said, good afternoon, Father. Right? And so on Monday morning, well, now we can really start. <laughs> the Diocese of Fall River is here. <laughs> um, 
And so on Monday morning, I called the principal, and he said, oh, yeah, Father, he said, we, uh, I heard you were here. Sorry, I wasn't here to greet you. Uh, how did it go? And I said, oh, fine. I said, uh, but I just wanted to bring something to your attention. As we were walking around, not a single kid greeted us priests. And he said, well, you know, our kids are usually pretty sociable. He said, but you know, maybe because you were strangers. And I said, Ed, in the Catholic community, no priest is ever a stranger. Because we're all members of a family. I said, and ironically, I said, I troop around the streets of New York City probably six, seven days a month. And I'm greeted as a priest by hookers, cops, drug addicts, Wall Street executives, right? I said, and not to be greeted in a Catholic high school is emblematic of a serious problem. Oh, well, thank you for bringing that to my attention. <laughs> One of the teachers on the faculty calls me a couple of weeks later, and she said, oh, you featured at our faculty meeting. Oh. <laughs> the principal said, well, our very illustrious alumnus that we all know, Father Stravinsky's, uh, was grossly offended that our students didn't bow and scrape to him and the other priests who were visiting. <laughs> so please be sure to tell your kids that if they ever see a priest, be sure they say, hello, Father, hello, Father. Now, where's our problem, okay? <laughs> you know, the Sicilian proverb, fish rots from the head, okay? So I called him back and I told him I heard about it. <laughs> and uh, so, Catholic identity. First of all, what are we talking about here? It's a unique way of seeing reality, right? Sometimes people say faith is not seen. That's not correct. Faith is not not seen. Faith is seen according to a different prescription, if you will. Huh? Uh, <clears throat> so, for instance. Uh, I have an astigmatism, all right? So I can drive without glasses, you know, but if I look at this page, I, even though I've read this page a dozen times, I have no idea what's on there, right? I put the glasses on and it puts everything into focus. That's what faith does. It corrects our natural sight, all right? And so that's the vision that we share with our students. But it has to be a vision that's common to all of us who are serving on that faculty. And as I mentioned in this earlier session, our goal is that every student and teacher become a saint. Okay? Uh, a Catholic school is a liturgical community. Okay? Uh, so we, <clears throat> we function, we live, huh? we live by the church's calendar. And so Advent, Lent, Christmas, right? Uh, these and these are manifest in the decorations, all right? Uh, in the celebrations. So, you know, we don't have a Christmas mass before the kids go home uh, for Christmas break, right? That's Advent, all right? We don't have Christmas parties. Uh, as a pastor, the first fight that I ever got into in all three parishes was abolishing Christmas parties during Advent, right? And I would say, no, that's for Christmas. Christmas is December 25th to the Feast of the Lord's Baptism. Have all the Christmas parties you want then. Well, but no one has them then. Well, see, if you have them then, people will come to your party, all right? <laughs> uh, but, but also, the saints, huh? So, you know, it's not just a perfunctory prayer over the PA system in the morning, huh? You know, today is the feast of, you know, Saint Cunegunda, all right? <laughs> and tell something about the saint, okay? And maybe even give a goal. How you know, Saint so-and-so epitomized the virtue of humility. Uh, how are you going to live that today in, in school day, all right? Uh, a reading... You know, from scripture, uh, maybe from uh, you know the mass readings during Advent and Lent. Uh, <clears throat> I have two you know wonderful little volumes I produce for Advent and Lent. Uh, just one page reflections on the readings for the day. 
that can be used over the PA system. Uh, and if we're talking about the church being a liturgical community, the absolute necessity of Sunday Mass. It is inconceivable to me that a kid could go to a Catholic school and not go to Mass on Sunday. Right? Uh, it is completely counterintuitive. And uh, when I was a high school administrator, I mandated Sunday Mass. Uh, four missed Masses in a semester, expelled. No discussion. Right? Uh, now, of course, you're going to ask, how did you enforce that? Right? There's two things. One, everybody would have to come into homeroom on Monday morning with a signed bulletin, signed by the past, whoever the celebrant of the Mass was, all right? And uh, now, my mother didn't raise a dumb son. I know anybody can get a bulletin signed by somebody. So the second shoe dropped in religion class, where they would sit down for the first five minutes of religion class and write a two-paragraph essay on the homily they heard. Paragraph one, what did Father say? Paragraph two, what did you think of it? Right. And, uh, and it's amazing. I never got an ounce of pushback from a student or a parent. Can anyone guess where the opposition came from? <laughs> Pastors. Yeah. Exhausting. Do you understand the burden you're putting on us on Sunday morning, signing those bulletins, all right? Every pastor told me clearly that his teenage mass attendance had gone up by 50 to 60%. In any other organization, I would have gotten at least a gold watch. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Not in the church. No, no, all right? Now, what are you doing, all right? And I said, Father, I know, I say mass too. And, you know, it's like I'm on Calvary myself. And you know, at the end, I'm just so drained, right? He said, you're being sarcastic. I said, what else can you do? Right? Signing a bulletin. Right? That was the first objection. The second objection was, you're giving kids a bad taste for religion. Because you're forcing them to do this. I said, well, <clears throat> let me give you an example. The head of our English department requires every kid to go to a live Shakespeare play in Manhattan once a year. As you may know, in, in New York State, they don't get their driver's licenses until they're either 17 or 18 years old. And so that means there's a car service, right? Uh, the ticket at the time was probably 75 bucks. They're not gonna have a hot dog from a neat stand on the corner. They're gonna get something to eat. Uh, so we're talking probably about an investment of $150, $200. And every parent says, thank God Mrs. So-and-so does that. It's giving the kids an experience of culture, which we hope they'll take along for the rest of their lives. That's what we're doing here. We're giving them an orientation, what Thomas Aquinas calls the Ordinatio of Cultum, huh? the, the orientation toward worship, right? And this is critically important, right? Uh, <clears throat> and it was fascinating. I always paraded through the cafeteria at lunchtime, but on Fridays, it was really interesting. Because as I would go around, you'd hear kids say, where are you going to Mass on Sunday? Kids, I'm going to say Teresa's. What time? Five o'clock Sunday afternoon. Why there and then? Well, because the Cinemax down the road has a 6.30 showing, mm -hmm. and the kids were planning their weekend according to Sunday Mass. Never had a complaint from a parent. Well, first of all, what's a parent going to say? We don't go to Mass, right? Uh, but parents, parents said two things, positive. One, parents who were observant said, thank you, one less fight on Sunday morning, all right? Kids, get in the car, that's it, you know, you have to go. Or parents who had not been going and said, you know, Father, we fell away. And, and by the way, I think this is the case of most non practicing There's no hostility toward the church. It's just a bad habit. You got us back on the road. Thanks a lot, we appreciate it. Well, sister? What if they're not Catholic? They have to go to their own denomination and give evidence. We're a worshiping community. Okay. That's it. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> so, now you say, well, what about grammar school kids, right? Well, obviously, they can't drive, okay? They, 
and, and they can't, you know, walk a mile and a half to church. But when I get little ones in confession who confess missing mass on Sunday, I say, why don't you go? My mommy won't take me. And that's really a, a very sad thing to hear, huh? Because the kid really does want to go, huh? And I said, all right, let me ask you a question. If you wanted to go to the mall, or you wanted to go uh, to a movie, and your mother said no, <clears throat> what would you do? Well, I'd ask her again. I said, that's right. And if she still said no, what would you do? Well, I'd ask, I said, and, and probably you'd start stopping your feet and crying until she finally said, get in the van, let's go. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, so here's what you're going to do. This is your pennies. <laughs> <laughs> Starting at 4 o'clock on Saturday mm -hmm. until 7 p.m. on Sunday, you keep saying, I want to go to church. I want to go to church. And when your mother says, why are you doing it? You say, because the priest told me that it's not my sin, it's yours. And so I want to go to church, and I don't want to sin anymore. <laughs> but again, we have to put the burden where it belongs, right? And here are parents, you know, presumably, and you know, Rick said earlier, everybody doesn't have the purest motive for sending kids to Catholic school. They've got to cooperate with the process, right? And so we're telling kids in religion class that missing mass on Sunday is a mortal sin. But meanwhile, we're winking at the fact that probably you know, X percent of them aren't going. Now, there's another way to do this as well. I always say, and this is for grade school and high school both, Friday in religion class, a preview of the Sunday readings. <clears throat> Monday religion class, let's go around the room and share what we heard Father say in our parishes. Right? So what are we doing? There's a presumption of Sunday worship, both in anticipation on Friday and in the follow-up on Monday. Right? Uh, <clears throat> then, uh, we're also talking about uh, an atmosphere, and again, this is the more caught than taught type of thing. And so, what do we mean here? <clears throat> um, I was I gave a workshop for teachers in the Archdiocese of Miami a couple of years ago, uh, in the lead up to the school year, and I said, for instance, you're you're teaching math, and an ambulance goes by, and you say, boys and girls, put your books down, let's pray for the sick person. Let's pray for the, person, the medical personnel who are going to help. Uh, you're teaching social studies, and the church bell tolls for a funeral mass. Put our stuff down. Let's pray for the repose of the soul of the deceased. Let's pray for the consolation of the family. And this one teacher started to cry, and I thought, oh, geez, you know, <laughs> uh, God forbid I'd be called insensitive. And, uh, and so I said, and did I say something? And she said, oh, Father, that's so beautiful. That is so beautiful. She wasn't doing it. Why? Never heard about it, right? But once she heard, she thought it was something that was beautiful. And you can rest assured, she was going to integrate that into her method of, of, of teaching. And this goes back again to the point I made earlier. In the days when we had faculties predominantly composed of religious, this kind of thing was co-natural, huh? Now, with a largely lay faculty, these are things that have to be explicitly taught, right? So, you know, what kind of a bulletin board do you have in, in Advent, all right? Or what, what, what do you do in, in, in September, or October, or whatever else, all right? Uh, you know, we always had a principle that where there were two bulletin boards, the one was, you know, the subject or whatever, and the other was the liturgical season, right? Well, these are things that, again, have to be presented. And I'll say this, you know, I've been in this game an awfully long time. And some of the stuff I'm saying today, if I had said 35 years ago, I would have been laughed to scorn by a lot of the lay teachers at that time who were still leftovers of the 60s, right? They don't exist today, right? The young lay teachers that you have in Catholic schools today, for the most part, are devout practicing Catholics who may have kind of a more intuitive approach to the stuff. It's, it's not cognitive, huh? Uh, but once it's presented to them, they're more than willing to integrate that in, into their praxis, right? 
So it's an entirely different moment, and uh, and, and and we need to uh, to capitalize on this. Um, our schools should keep technology at bay and in its place. All the studies are now showing how devastating access to all of this stuff is, particularly for elementary school children. All right? uh, I'm of the mindset that before eighth grade, no kid should be involved with a computer. All right? I know that sounds ne uh, you know, Neanderthal, but again, you find all of the studies coming out now saying, it's bad for their eyes, it's bad for their creativity, it's bad for everything, all right? Uh, I, <clears throat> I was at a, a restaurant recently. There was a kid who probably was in fifth or sixth grade. It was a family, you know, someone's birthday at a big Italian restaurant. And this kid, and the waiter came and said, we're, we're taking orders, and he said, huh, what? Well, are, are you gonna have pasta? Uh, uh, you know, I guess so, okay, yeah. It was a universe, yeah? And the great irony, we're, we're talking about, you know, in that document we spoke of in the previous session, about depersonalization, right? There you have it, right? You've got people living by, you know, like an automaton, right? It's, it's a complete disaster. And and we shouldn't be afraid to call that out for, for what it is. Um, you know, Rick, I, his wife, as, as he said, they're both converts, uh, Princeton graduates, actually, where they met. And uh, his wife, uh, when their daughter uh, was, I guess, in seventh grade, and, and again, as he said, in the parish school, and uh, she said, uh, Mom, I, I need a telephone. Mm -hmm. And the mother said, for what? Well, everyone has a telephone. She said, well, that's a dumb reason. Why, why do you need a telephone? And she said, well, in case of an emergency. And Vera said, well, if everyone has a telephone, if there's an emergency, you can use one of their phones. <laughs> <laughs> and so when she came to eighth grade, the mother said, yeah, anything we can do for you for your birthday? I want a telephone. She said, okay, okay. So they brought her to the AT&T store. <clears throat> and she picked out, you know, it was whatever, uh, model 92 for this week. And, and so she, and then the guy's now explaining all the features. You can make your breakfast and it can do everything for you. And, and then the mother says, now, by the way, sir, this phone is to be activated for only two phone numbers, 911 and mine. You can do that, right? <laughs> and the guy said, yes. And the girl said, forget about it. Let's go. <laughs> all right. Uh, so, uh, did you know that Stephen Job of Apple? Never allowed his children to have iPads or yeah. any of that stuff. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah, you know, we've been you get into this thinking that you know somehow or other we're going to be thought to be you know uh, medieval or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I'd love to be medieval. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. We like sensual. <laughs> See, no sense of penance. And, and by the way, I gave these nuns a few retreats over the years. But Sister Mark, she. You know, Saint Mark was the amanuensis for Saint Peter. All right, she was the amanuensis for Father Peter. This woman is unbelievable. She transcribed an entire retreat I gave on the on the Psalms. Was it? Oh, yeah. yeah. I still have that. Wow. Yeah. And she. So perhaps. If Paul fails us with this recording, sister, we'll be there. <laughs> All right. Uh, <clears throat> but Father, there, and this is not only American, it's universal. Oh, sure. Uh, there are a lot of psychiatrists who have clients now because they recognize it as an addiction. Sure. It is an addiction. Oh, yeah. No, there's no question about we it. We deal with it all the time with our high school girls. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the sisters have international students uh, mm -hmm. uh, who are resident, and so they, they see this from, uh, you, have, you have India, and J you have Japan, or? We have China. Yeah, Japan, China. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah we have Japan, China, like Vietnam, mm -hmm. Ethiopia, Ethiopia. Yeah, no, it's, Minnesota. I mean, the virus is everywhere. <laughs> 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 
do have Texans as well. They can be considered a separate. <laughs> be careful, you've got two of them here. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what else in terms of Catholic identity? Um, good religious art in the classrooms, in the hallways, huh? Uh, not kitsch, all right? Good classical Catholic art. So, you know, for example, if you go through, you know, the Faith and Life Religion textbook series, the wonderful art that's in there, right? We have to introduce kids to a Catholic culture, huh? And, uh, <clears throat> and so, you know, the various saints or the you know, events in the life of Christ and, and so forth. Uh, I was in a high school recently, and, uh, you know, these silly posters that could have come from 1960, you know, bloom where you're planted, whatever the hell that means, and, uh, you know, all this nonsense. And, and I said to the principal, well, you know, where's the, where's the Christian art? And he said, well, you know, you got to make it stuff that the kids can relate to. I said, are you telling me your students are morons? And of course the problem is, it's not the kids that are morons, it's the administrator who is, you know? And also projections, you know? Because it means nothing to me, obviously it could not mean anything to anybody else. Uh, but, you know, classical art. Uh, music, good, good liturgical music. If, if you want to see that played out, go to Atonement Academy in San Antonio. Gregorian chant, Anglican chant, Renaissance polyphony, done by grammar school kids, all right, all right? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I visited a high school in the Archdiocese of um, Louisville back in Lent, and it's a K-12 classical school. <clears throat> I walked into a fourth grade music class. <clears throat> and the teacher had no idea I was coming. They were rehearsing a poly polyphonic version of Ave, Ma Ave Maris Stella. Fourth graders, right? That's very doable, right? So the strum and hum business, yeah, that should be over with. Anyone who plays a guitar at a mass should have it smashed over his head, right? Uh, this is what our Catholic patrimony. And if we're not giving this to our kids, we are cheating them, all right? Uh, <clears throat> it's interesting, you'll hear some uh, campus ministers from good Catholic colleges say, you know, they've got kids coming from you know, decent, decent Catholic high schools, and in these places they're giving them good liturgical music, and the kids say, but we want traditional music, meaning the nonsense they grew up with in their parishes, which for them is tradition, right? But, you know, let's expand the, our horizons here. And, uh, you know, the parish school that I went to, you know, two miles from here, <clears throat> by fourth grade, we had committed to memory seven Gregorian chant masses, right? Uh, marvelous, you know, and, and very good. My kids <laughs> love doing that kind of stuff, right? Uh, when I was in high school work, and, you know, gradually would introduce kids to chant. And so, you know, this week we're going to, you know, learn a Kyrie. And you'd hear the kids walking around and changing classes. Carry out last Sunday, kids are Christ out last Sunday. And kids love memorizing stuff besides, all right? And, uh, you know, I said earlier, if you haven't memorized it, you don't own it, all right? <laughs> These things are critically important. I think memorization is another component in this thing. Uh, I was at a uh, uh, New Jersey motor vehicle uh, registration. You, I assure you, anyone from New Jersey who's gone through the motor vehicle, there is no purgatory for you, right? It's all been endured while you're online for this. And so, you know, you get your, your little ticket, like at a supermarket, and you're waiting, and the woman who was giving out the tickets, she said, Father, I'd really like to let you go ahead, but these people would start screaming. I said, that's all right, don't worry. And so we get talking, and she says, you know, I went to Catholic school, I, I loved it. I really, she said, except I hated, I hated memorizing the catechism questions. And so I let her vent for a bit and we talked about other stuff and I said, at one point I said, hey, who is God? She said, God is supreme being, infinitely perfect, who made all things and keeps them in existence. I said, hmm. what's a sacrament? The sacrament is not what sign is to I said, hmm. I said, I don't dare guess a woman's age, but 
I do suppose that this is probably going back a few decades. She said, I said, see, you know that. You know that. That's a part of you now. Um, I was visiting a wonderful, wonderful grammar school in the Archdiocese of Miami. Uh, taught 900 kids in the school, six habited nuns, right? <laughs> and the principal said to me, be sure to visit the junior high religion classes. The teacher there is superb. He has masters in theology and he's done really good stuff with the kids. And so I walked into a sixth or seventh grade class. And I said, what are we doing? They said, we're learning about the sacraments. What's, what sacrament are you on? And they said, matrimony. And I said, oh, okay. And I said, so what's a sacrament? And kids said, it's a religious ceremony. And I said, uh, so is benediction of the blessed sacrament? Uh, no, no, that's not a sacrament. And I said, is um, novena to the miraculous mount? Mm, no, no. The kids said, well, there are seven of them. And I said, okay, well, and they could name them. And, but I couldn't get a definition, right? And, uh, and so I gave a, a, a standard definition, and I said, now let's look at each of the seven sacraments. And the teacher, again, totally orthodox, he said, Father, he said, I'm really embarrassed. He said, you have shown a huge gap in what I've been doing here. And uh, I'm going to give you some materials later in the week a permanent deacon in the Diocese of Pittsburgh. I gave a talk to their teachers in, in Lent also, I guess. And, uh, <clears throat> and he's put together this catechetical program of effectively making uh, a new kind of version of the Baltimore Catechism and uh, with all kinds of you know, aids and so forth. Very, very well done. So I put in, you know, uh, for that. Um, discipline. And that discipline be consistent. Huh? <clears throat> and Rick mentioned earlier about it being fair, right? Applied across the spectrum. So just because, you know, daddy contributed toward the, the new uh, turf on the football field, uh, his kids don't get a pass for misbehaving, all right? Uh, <clears throat> so that it's consistent, uh, that it's just that the punishment fits the crime, and so forth. Huh? Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and, and again, you know, kids perceive these things. Uh, and, and the goal of discipline in a Catholic school is ultimately what? Self-discipline. So the theory is, if I facilitate, or if I provide uh, the framework for these kids to live and, and function, uh, that at a certain point, that's going to be automatic, right? Uh, and we think that's how virtue works, huh? Uh, Mother Teresa used to say, you know, the first couple of times that she was dealing with these, you know, filthy, dying people in the streets, she wanted to vomit, right? <clears throat> uh, and little by little, this became something that was what? Co-natural. And uh, we're going to have a, a video later in the week on that wonderful virtue program produced by the Dominican Sisters of Ann Arbor, right? And, uh, but a virtue-oriented approach to discipline. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, high standards, high academic standards, high behavioral standards. Uh, so it's not what Thomas Merton called the civilization of hyenas, right? Uh, it's, we are human beings and we work with each other and we live with each other according to the standards of, of, of the gospel. Uh, this is one of the problems. I mean, if you have the best teacher in a government school who wants to do all the right stuff, she's hemmed in by the law. So if she says, for example, to a kid, <clears throat> you're cheating on that test and you're not supposed to do that, that's wrong. And the kid says, why? Well, because, well, it's not right. Well, well says who? Right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, of course, it always reminds me of that episode with Archie Bunker, where he was going to take the uh, high school equivalency exam, and, <clears throat> and Meathead catches him producing cheat sheets. And, uh, and, 
and the son-in-law says to him, Archie, that's cheating. That's, you're not being honest. And he said, Meathead, I'm being very honest. He said, yesterday morning, I looked in the mirror and I said, Archie, can you pass this test without cheating? And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but see, in a Catholic scheme of things, you say to a kid, it's not right to cheat for a number of reasons. First of all, because you're actually harming other people in the class by doing that. But also there's a commandment of God. So you're stealing material and you're lying because you're signing a paper that's effectively saying, oh, so now there's what? There's a supernatural motive for the discipline, right? It's not arbitrary. It's not because the teacher says it, all right? Or some cultural you know, connivance that, that puts us in, into that mode. Um, and then the, the school needs to be permeated by an attitude of hopefulness and joy. Hmm? Uh, <clears throat> that high school that I referred to earlier, that I inherited, uh, that was you know, such a mess. I was there about a month, and a, a woman called and she said, <clears throat> um, I'm doing a survey of, uh, I'm, I'm doing a master's program at some university, and I want, I'm surveying a number of schools, and I'd like to go visit, spend a day in your school. And I thought, oh Lord, this is the last thing I need, is the word to get out how bad this place is. And, and so I said, well, you know, I'm only here a month, and uh, I'm feeling my own way. Uh, yeah, call back in a couple of months, and I figured, yeah, she forget about it. No, she called back in a couple of months. And I said, oh Lord, what am I gonna do? So I tried to put her in classes that had decent teachers at least. And, uh, and at the change of periods, about mid-morning, we bumped into each other and she said, and she was a Mormon, and she said, Father, do you know what kind of school you have here? And I thought, oh no, <laughs> this will be in the local newspaper now. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? And she said, <clears throat> I'm so impressed. She said, these kids, they like their teachers, they respect them, they enjoy being in school, and they're really nice to each other. And I said, well, yeah, I mean, I thought that was sort of a given. But see, you know, that's the framework I'm coming, that's normal. It's not where she was coming from. And she saw this as something so entirely different. And it really helped change my perspective on how to change the problematic areas of the school. Because she saw something there that was so fundamentally different. Right? And as I said, as I ventured into some of these public schools in the past year or two, it's, it's amazing to see the incredibly bad behavior huh? uh, <coughs> toward each other, toward each other. Huh? Uh, and the F-bomb, you know, I mean, it's like and or but, you know. If you, you, know, if you drop the F-bomb from their conversation, you know, that's all you're left with is hand and butt. Uh, so uh, those are, are intangibles, huh? Uh, but simply because they're intangible uh, doesn't mean they're not real. Uh, and that we're dealing with an integrated curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Mike is going to talk about you know, this whole classical approach to education. Uh, but no matter what you're dealing with, an integration of the curriculum uh, with religious and moral values. The only place that we teach religion uh, is not the religion class, all right? The purpose of a Catholic school is that we re teach religion all day long, all right? It's not compartmentalized. I used to tell my religion teachers, I don't want you to spend an inordinate amount of time in religion class on abortion. No. When the teacher finishes the science unit on fetology or genetics, aha, that's the point at which, and Sister Mark is a great science teacher, she's gonna tell you all about this stuff, right? Uh, but that's the point at which you say, the church takes science so seriously, right? And science tells us categorically, this is a human being with 46 chromosomes, da, 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 da. and because the church takes science seriously, and because she takes philosophy seriously, this is because that's a human being, that has inalienable rights. 
That's why the Catholic Church says you can't kill that kid. I was visiting a high school in the Diocese of Gaylord, and uh, I went into a science class, and the teacher, of course, teachers are like priests. They hate to be evaluated, all right? You know, who's, who's looking, who's talking? You know? uh, and I walked into the, the science class, and, and she was handing out some kind of document, and she said, oh, oh, Father, oh. And I said, go ahead, go ahead. And she gave me, she said, we just finished <clears throat> the unit on genetics, and so today we're going to look at Cardinal Ratzinger's document, Donum Vitae. Right. Yeah, exactly what should be done, huh? Why are we doing that in religion class? That's, you know, that's a deus ex machina there, right? No, this woman had the perfect idea. It's integration of the curriculum. Uh, when I was visiting one of the high schools in the Archdiocese of Detroit, <clears throat> I was in a psychology class, and a kid was misbehaving, very nasty to another kid, and the teacher said, where's that coming from? And, well, I don't like him because she said, go up to the board and pull down that quote from Mother Teresa on what your, be what your behavior just like exhibits. Well, and she made him read out this quote about how to treat other people, right? Part of psychology. And she was talking about outward behavior in the class, by the way, for the day. <laughs> and the kid exhibited it for her. Uh, but, uh, so, uh, in, that, in that high school, also in, uh, in the Gaylord Diocese, uh, Bishop Hebda had said to me, I don't want to tell you, you know, how to run things, which meant, of course, he was going to try to do that. And uh, <clears throat> he said, but there's a gal who teaches sophomore religion, he says she's a little spitfire, and she teaches apologetics. And by the way, if you're talking about religion curriculum, apologetics needs to be a part of every religion class, right? Uh, <laughs> and uh, more than ever, more than ever. At any rate, he said, she's tremendous. So I went into, by accident, into her religion class with the superintendent of the schools, and again, she got nervous. I said, oh, go ahead. She said, all right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, she said, we're in Revelation 12. And she said, there are three characters here. Huh? The woman, her child, and the beast. Where have we met those three characters before? Kid says, Genesis 3.15. And she said, that's right. And what did we say was the big theological word for that? And the kid shouted out, Proto-Evangelium. I leaned over to the superintendent and I said, 95% of the priests of this diocese wouldn't know that answer. <laughs> <laughs> but again, challenge, huh? Challenge, right? And the kids respond to it. Uh, you, you, you see it all over the place. I, I visited a number of the high schools in the Archdiocese of, of Los Angeles. One where Monsignor Pilato had been principal with what, 72% non-Catholic population, right? Uh, and uh, I, I always meet with the student council, you know, and so we're having lunch and, and it's what, at least 70% black uh, and uh, not Catholic. And I said to these student council officers, what do you like most about uh, Sarah High School? And this girl said, I love adoration. <laughs> and I said, Really, and the school has it, I guess, once or twice a week or whatever. And, uh, and kids can leave the classroom to go. And I said, what do you love about it? She said, I just sit there and talk to Jesus, and I tell him. And I thought it was like John Vianney, the story with, you know, the guy says, I look at him and he looks at me. But here's a non-Catholic kid, right, uh, who says, you know, this is the most important part of, of this high school experience, adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, and if our schools are not getting converts, we've got a serious problem, right? I have no problem with non-Catholics in Catholic schools, right? But an essential part of Catholic education is evangelization, right? And uh, I was in a very heated conversation with <clears throat> uh, a, a principal some time ago who said, well, I quote Cardinal Hickey, we do it because we're Catholic, not because they are. And I said, I said, that's a cop-out. Uh, 
I said, I said, we're not talking about proselytism. We're talking about if we're giving a good Catholic witness at a certain point along the highway, there should be a substantial number of kids and their families who say, this all makes sense and I want to be a part of it. Okay? Uh, as a seminarian, I was vice principal of an inner city grammar school in Trenton. My first Holy Week there, which had nothing to do with me because I just came on board. But 28 kids and their families became Catholics. Right? Uh, and some cynical priest said, oh yeah, so they get the Catholic school tuition rate. I said, if that were the case, they would do it in first grade, not seventh grade. Right? Uh, but no, th this needs to be a part of the project. And in that same high school, and we, Monsignor and I discussed this, they introduced an RCA program for the non-Catholic kids. Right? Uh, there was some crazy idea that they couldn't do RCIA in a Catholic high school. They had to go to a parish. How absurd. Their, their, their contact with the Catholic faith is coming through that school, right? That's their Catholic community, right? Not some artificial parish that they know nobody in, right? But these are all, you can see, I mean, this is, again, an overarching, all-encompassing phenomenon. And that's what we're involved with, huh? So it's not simply the checklist, but I've given you items for a checklist, okay? So.